All right, everyone. I think, thanks for uh, thanks for coming. This is our uh, uh, department lecture series for uh, the Department of Science and Computer Science. We have uh, Dan Schiffler here from uh, uh, Clarion University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dan is a, an associate professor at Clarion. We went to grad school together, and uh, he's a uh, uh, non-commutative green theorist with an interest in mathematics and pop culture. So it's a good mix. So he's going to talk to us not about non-commutative ring theory, but mathematics and pop culture. So he's going to tell us about game theory through movies and TV. Uh, so thanks, then. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Leo, and uh, thank you to the Math and Computer Science Department and Rick for inviting me. Rick's a really nice guy. Uh, <laughs> we'll be the end So I got to make sure I thank him personally that he shows up with Rick here. Nice. Uh, anyway, uh, yes, I'm going to talk about hopefully a uh, game theory, not not going to be the great theory for you. Um, you might be wondering what what's that other picture up there on uh, on, on my first screen here. Uh, you might know that as a groundhog. Does that sound familiar? Groundhog. Okay. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we also call that a meteorologist. <laughs> right? And you laugh, but on February second, he said six more weeks of winter. Right, and look out the window. So. Uh, you know, don't 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 give him too much flack. He's alright. Uh, so game theory. Uh, so I spent a lot of time making this graph uh, to kind of explain what game theory is and what you need to do game theory. Right? It's one of these uh, areas of mathematics that gets floated around because it's got this cool title, game theory. That's about games. That's going to be fun. Right? Well, yeah, for a while until you want to do really really hard stuff. Then you got to learn a lot of stuff. Um, this presentation, luckily, we're just going to be working with uh, logic and a little bit of algebra. Um, so make sure you have paper and pencil available when we get to that point in the talk. Uh, we're not going to get any uh, deeper than that, but your but game theory takes from all these areas of mathematics, calculus and linear algebra. Then you start bringing economics and all the other sciences, like biology, chemistry, all involved, to do something with game theory. Um, so as a reference, probably the most famous game theorist is somebody by the name of John Nash. Have you heard of him? from the Beautiful Mind movie. Actually, he was before the movie. The movie's based on him. Um, John Nash on this graph, uh, right about there. So that's what, uh, if you really want to uh, make your name in game theory, that's where you got to get to. Okay, so I'll get you to our dot. You can get yourself the rest of the way. All right, okay, good. So, you might, you might be asking yourself, man, what did I get into? No, you might be asking yourself, what is game theory? Good question. It starts with a game. And you say, all right, Captain Obvious. What is a game? Well, a game is uh, like an event. It, it's like an undertaking that has players, okay? At least two players, can have more. Great. Uh, these players have strategies, things they can do, uh, and these strategies um, lead to payoffs, right? So if you have those three things, you have players, strategies, and payoffs, you probably have a, a game, and you can probably do some game theory, okay? So I gave, I gave this really intense title, right? Game theory for movies and, uh, and TV. I'm going to start with an example from classic literature, right? Because that's where movies and TV come from, right? They come from the literature first. So here's our first example. It's called The Gift of the Magi. Am I saying that right? I've never heard of it. Yes. Magi. Yes. Uh, it's a short story from, uh, by Old Henry from the turn of the century. Last century, not this century, right? Around 1900. And it's a story about. Uh, a, uh, a young couple, a young married couple, Jim and Della. They live in a small apartment uh, in the city, I think New York City. Uh, they don't have much money. It's Christmas Eve and they have to get gifts for each other. Right? After paying all the bills for the day, uh, Jim is out at work or something. Della, Della finds she only has $1.87 left to spend on Jim's gift. So she goes out, she's walking around, she's trying to find a gift for Jim and she finds one. She finds a chain to attach to his most prized possession in the world, his pocket watch. He has a gold, very valuable pocket watch that was passed down from his grandfather and his father to him. And Della finds a chain to attach it uh, you know, to his waistband or something. He says, wow, that's great. Unfortunately, it costs $21. She has $1.87. Okay. Um, while Della herself has one very valuable item, her long golden hair. She's been letting it grow out forever long and it's beautiful and she can sell it to a wig maker and get $20. Okay. 
uh, Bella's love for Jim is stronger than her admiration for her golden hair and does that, just that. She cuts off her hair, sells it to the wig maker, gets $20 to go buy, goes and buys Jim the perfect Christmas present, the chain for his, his pocket watch. So she goes home, she's making dinner, Jim walks in the door and just stops because she cut her hair, right? Well, as long as he's known Della, he's known her for her long golden hair and he just stops. And, and Della says, it's okay, it's okay, it'll grow back. I had to cut it because I wanted to, uh, you know, I had to cut it for Christmas. And Jim just, he's still silent. From behind his back, he pulls out his gift for Della. And she opens it and finds it's two handmade beautiful combs for her long, beautiful golden hair. And that's why Jim was silent when he stepped, stepped in the door. Bella says, it's okay, my hair will grow back. I had to sell it so I could give you this. And she pulls out his gift and hands it to him. And he opens it and pulls, pulls out the chain. And he just collapses onto the couch. And she goes, Jim, what's wrong? What's wrong? He said, well, to get you your combs, I had to sell my pocket watch. This is a great story, but it's also a great way to introduce in theory. We have two players, Jim and Della. Jim and Della both have strategies in this game. What are they going to do for a Christmas gift for the other? Okay. Here are the options that I see, the strategies in this game. They can sell their most prized possession to get more money to buy a nice gift for their significant other, or they can hold on to that prized possession and just buy whatever they can afford with their, like Della's dollar eighty seven, whatever money they have. Okay. So any combination of those two things is a strategy. Usually in game theory, we don't list them out like this, we list them out in a nice uh, array. Right, we have Jim uh, across the top and Della across the side. Here are their two options. Wherever those rows and columns intersect, that's what happens in the game. Right. So the next thing we have to figure out are payoffs. What are, these, what are these outcomes going to be worth to the players in the game? Now, uh, payoffs are tricky, and I'm not going to get too deep into the payoffs. You can, there's an entire field, subfield, I guess, of game theory. Uh, where they just studied how do we figure out the numbers to put in here? How do we figure out the payoffs for this game? Okay, so I'm going to do some very simplistic payoffs, uh, mainly because all of these examples that you're going to see today come from students just like you. Right? I didn't come up with these examples. Right? I helped a little bit, but these are all from a class in game theory I taught in the fall, last semester. So all these examples, uh, I use this book. It's a good book if you're interested in more game theory, uh, called Game Theory and Strategy. Um, but all these examples come from the final project those students had to do. I said, go out and find an example of game theory, right? And use what you learned in class to analyze it. So the, the individual who looked at the gift of the Magi came up with these payoffs. She said, I'm not going to put any monetary value. I'm just going to rank these things from zero to three. Zero being the last thing that they want, and three being the first thing, that, the, the three being the, the outcome they want to have. So of course, Della doesn't think Jim is going to sell his pocket watch, right? She's going to cut off her hair, buy the chain, give it to Jim, and he's going to be ecstatic. That is her preferred outcome. Jim is the exact opposite, right? He doesn't think Della's going to cut off her hair, so he's going to sell his pocket watch, buy these beautiful combs, and give them to Della, right? Um, the opposite is the worst for them, right? Because they've gone through all this work uh, to get the other, other individual a, a nice, or uh, the other individual has gotten them such a nice gift that they have nothing to show. In the middle, we have the two middle options, um, where they both keep their most prized prize possession and just buy whatever they can afford. That's the second. Uh, and then the third option, they both sell and, and end up giving gifts that are no longer useful, exactly what happened in the store. So you put these into the matrix, and you get pairs of numbers. The first number uh, on the left of each pair represents Della's payoff, how she ranks that outcome. The second number, the right number, represents Jim's payoff, how he ranks the outcome. So the question is, what do we consider a solution in game theory, right? And, and does that solution match what happened in the story, right? Because I doubt old Henry was writing this story thinking, oh, what would the game theorists say these, these couple should do? Well, the easiest way to think about it is to pretend we landed an outcome, right? Let's pretend we landed, we were right here, because this is kind of where we were to start the night, down here in the bottom right, where they both keep their most valuable option, they're just going to buy whatever they can afford for each other. Okay? And so that's a payoff of two to each of them. Well, Della says to herself, well, wait a minute. If instead of keeping my hair, I sell it, I can move up to this corner, the three zero, and do better. Right? I can have a better Christmas because I, you know, I can show my affection for Jim by buying this nice gift. 
So she moves up by saying three is better than two. Unfortunately, Jim says the same thing, doesn't he? He's down here in the bottom right. Remember, he's the right number here. He's the right two. He says, wow, I could do better if I move to the left, if I sell my pocket watch and give my wife a nice gift. We usually denote these with arrows in game theory, and what we call a movement diagram. So the arrows show how the players would move from one option to the next. So they both move out of that corner. Unfortunately, if they both move out of that corner, they both end up in the opposite corner where the story ended up, right? Where they sell their most valuable item, right? which is no longer, uh, to get something valuable for, some, for the other person, which is no longer useful. Okay. So they went from what seemed like a better option down here, a better payoff for each of them, to two, to something that's obviously worth, worse for both of them. And game theory says, well, that's exactly what they should have done. Right? Game theory doesn't have, isn't really into emotions, right? Love and stuff, it's hard to, it's hard to incorporate that into game. So in this story, they match exactly what the game, this game theory matrix would say. This matrix up here goes by another name you might have heard of. This is called the prisoner's dilemma. I just thought it'd be a little nicer to look at it this way instead of uh, prisoners. <laughs> All right, so now you're asking yourself, great, um, when are we getting to the movies and TV? Ah, oh, right now, here's, here's our next example. Uh, next two examples. First one from the movie Footloose, 1980s, right? You probably weren't even born then. <laughs> so here's the scene from uh, the movie. Uh, so we got uh, we have two guys, we have Ren and Chuck. Ren is the good guy. Uh, that's him right there, played by the uh, the immortal Kevin Bacon. Uh, Chuck is the bad guy. He's wearing black. We'll see him in a minute. They're they're in fisticuffs over something. I forget, but they decide to get into a game of chicken that involves trackers. So let's uh, see how this turns out. <laughs> Then the second worst, besides staying on track until they collide, is, is if 
if you jump off and the other person stays on. If you both jump off, you lose a little face, face because you both were chicken, but since you both did it, it's kind of a tie. That's the 2-2 two -two in the bottom corner. So if we draw the movement diagram, you might not be surprised that we get two reasonable solutions here, don't we? One of you should stay on the tractor and the other one should jump off, right? Well, that's the game of chicken. Who blinks first, or uh, blinks first, right? Who, who jumps off their tractor first? Okay. Now, in this game, we had uh, Ren get his shoelace caught on the tractor, right? So dodge for Ren, the whole bottom row of this matrix wasn't really an option. So if you cover up the bottom row of the matrix, you can see why Chuck chose to dodge. It's not great, but it's better than the alternate. So there's more going on. This is how the game would set up if the, if the shoelace weren't caught. But because it got caught, it got a little simpler. And that's why we chose the uh, option in the top right where Ren stayed on and dodge, uh, Chuck dodged off the, the uh, track. Okay. All right, our next example comes from the TV show Friends. How many of you have seen that? Friends TV show. All right. This, these examples seem to be skewed to the back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this example uh, is around Valentine's Day. There's a couple on the show, Chandler and Monica, and they decide um, that they're going to make each other gifts for Valentine's Day. They're not going to buy them. They're going to make them this, this, this year. Uh, and they decide this like a week before Valentine's Day. Well, of course they both forget. Right? So it's the day they're, they're having their Valentine's dinner and neither of them has made a gift for the other. Now, uh, Chandler goes running around trying to find something to make very, very quickly. He doesn't come up with anything. At the last minute, he finds a mixtape that an old girlfriend had made for him. Right? And we mean a literal tape, like a cassette tape. That's all the show is. Uh, and he, he decides that's good enough. Right, so we're going to pick up the scene where he's just giving that to Monica, uh, and then Monica's going to give her, her last minute gift to uh, Chandler. Okay, you ready to open your Still thinks that Chandler made it. 
So we're almost really in this part of the matrix, the top center, where it's bad for Monica because she had to lie, or she said, oh, I forgot. And Ch Chandler's still living the lie, saying, yeah, yeah, I made this great thing state for you. Uh, and that's why Chandler doesn't come clean. He's sitting up here with a pretty good payoff for himself, a three, uh, and Monica's uh, had to tell the truth. She's at a negative. Okay. So we're sitting up here. Um, Chandler thinks he's, he's got it. Yeah, everything's set, right? He comes out ahead in a relationship. Right? But this is a sitcom. You want to see if it plays out that way? I think Chandler can get away with it.
show killing people is not a big thing? Okay. Um, her best option, of course, is uh, that Rob doesn't, or that Ned doesn't say anything to Rob. Okay? So she doesn't have to do anything. Uh, and her worst option is, is if he does end up telling King, the King Rob and she, does, she hasn't killed him or anything, what's going to happen as a result of that? Now, if you look at these payoffs carefully, you'll notice that Ned, if he's using game theory to make his decision, really doesn't have a choice. All of his payoffs point up. Like he does better to tell Rob no matter what. Right? Well, if that's the case, uh, you can draw in your own arrows for Cersei. They all point to the only non-negative number in that row, which is to take Ned out. So based on the way that they set up, my students set up the payoffs for this game, that should have been what happened based on the game. Now that's not what really happened. Does anybody know what really happened in the game? Can you tell me? Because I have no idea what happened. Oh, Rob he gets killed first. Rob gets killed first. That sounds familiar, okay? Did Ned tell him? No. No, no. so it's this down here? So she kills the king before Ned. Man, that doesn't look good for either. How'd that turn out? Not very well. Not, not very well, all right. It's not. <laughs> All right, so, uh, yeah, not everybody listens to Game Theory. Also, notice that my dominance, we, we pretty much said, all right, Ned is definitely going to tell Rob, and this is the best that Cersei can do, this is the highlighted one. But notice this bottom left option is better for both of them, again. The status quo, don't tell, don't do anything. Right? That's kind of like a knock against dominance, isn't it? Like, this, this option down here is better in both cases. Why wouldn't you keep that available? All right, good. So now you might be asking yourself, uh, why can't we just go watch Game of Thrones? Uh, no, no, you should, you should be asking yourself, well, what if the arrows don't point together? Right? What if you don't have a, a, a place to stop? I'm glad, I'm glad you asked right, yourself. Uh, let's watch Jeopardy for an example. An unusual category, the decorative arts. Gentlemen, here's your book. In the early 1700s in Dresden, King Augustus walked up a chemist until he found how to make this product dubbed white gold. You have 30 seconds to watch. There we go. It was a ceramic. Sorry? It's something they figured out how to make the Chinese uh, uh -huh. pottery. What's it called? Of course. Yes. <clears throat> uh, so notice that uh, there are only two, two uh, contestants left in this example. The guy in the head was like 9,000, the guy behind was like 5,000, the leader in the, in the trailer. We had to give it a thought moment and think, what's the rest of the things for one of the things I see? We come to you first, you have 5,200, you wrote down, what is porcelain? Yes, you are right, and you will almost double. You will go up to 10,399. The lead is yours as we come to our four-day championship. <coughs> Did he come up with porcelain? He did not make gunpowder. How much money did you lose? 801. All right. Well, you had a pretty good week anyway, but I've seen loading. Congratulations, gentlemen. You're here. You have a Did you notice their betting patterns? What? What? Now, now, of course, you can bet any amount of money, right? Between zero and how much you have. But really, there's two options in each case. What are, for the trailer, what are his options to bet? But there, there are two reasonable options. Well, you, they, you could, the, the trailer could definitely go all in. In fact, that's pretty much what he did. Because you'll lose. If, if, if the guy is in he doesn't go all in, then he's going to lose. Either way, it's in his best interest to just go all in. For the trailer? Because okay. If he loses, he loses. If you got it wrong, you got it wrong. It's only when you get it right that you win. Yeah, so but if, if you think you're going to get it wrong and you bet nothing, he's still he's lost. He still has it, but he doesn't know. He doesn't know what his opponent's going to bet. If you're in the trail, you have to go. You have to go all in, all right. We don't need game theory, right? <laughs> you're the trail. Well, you're on the right track. Um, they, I'm going to show a slightly different example where you, you might start to see the second option. But as a trailer, yeah, you pretty much either want to bet everything or bet nothing, right? Or almost everything, right? Those are pretty much your two options, nothing or everything. As the leader, of course, you could bet nothing. That's always an option. Or you bet just enough to beat the trailer if he bets every, he or she bets everything and gets it right. right. That's exactly what happened in this game. Now the trailer got it right, and the leader got, got it wrong, so the trailer ended up ahead. 
uh, in this game. But that's exactly, those are pretty much the two major options for uh, uh, Now, to compute the payoffs here, uh, you, you have to factor in the, the idea that, that the players either get the question right or wrong. Um, and so the four in the top left there means that in the four cases um, where uh, the trailer gets it right, the, the, the leader gets it right, the trailer gets it wrong, the leader gets it right, the four outcomes that can happen, the, the leader wins all four times. So if the leader and the trailer both bet nothing, the leader is just going to win. It doesn't matter what happens. Right? So that's why it's a 4-0. Okay? The bottom right corner, is the 3-1, is what happened in the game. The leader bet just enough to beat the trailer. If they both got it right, the only time he would lose is if, he, if the leader got it wrong and the trailer got it right. And that's what happened in the show that we showed. That's the 3-1. In the other two cases, it's split 2-2. There are two ways for the leader to win, two ways for the, the trailer to win. Okay? Um, the movement diagram doesn't point to one option. It points around in a circle, round and round we go. So what do we do? All right, quiz time. Did you catch how many times was the leader a, a returning champion? Four times. Four times, excellent, good job. He was a four time returning champion. All right, which means he gets to play this game more than once, doesn't he? Right? He doesn't have to just choose one time. He can, he can pick the way that he bets, right? Today I'm going to bet zero. Tomorrow I'm going to bet, uh, bet you know, enough. Uh, tomorrow is zero. He can switch back and forth. He doesn't have to pick one strategy to stick with it. So he can pick a fraction of strategies. And that's exactly what you do. That's what we call a mixed strategy. Right? So what we do is we assign variables, right? You play zero, you bet nothing X percent of the time. So you're going to bet the 8,001, the one extra dollar, the other one minus x amount of time. And then you set up equations based on your payoffs and you say, here's what I want to happen. I want the same chance to win whether, my, whether the opponent, the trailer, bets zero or bets everything. So you set up two equations that equal each other and you solve for x. Right? Good old classic algorithm. Right? When you do that, you can do it for y as well, which are the, uh, the trailer's proportions. If you do it for y as well, you get a, a, a mixed strategy of betting zero one-third of the time and betting the higher amount two-thirds of the time. A mixed strategy. That's what game theory says you should do in this case. If you can't have, if the arrows don't point to one option, you should have a fraction of options between the two strategies. Now, this does make a bunch of assumptions, right? It does assume that uh, the players have a 50-50 shot of getting the questions right or wrong, right? If you think, if the, you think you're good in that, that category, maybe you, uh, you play a more conservative game. Okay. So there are a lot of assumptions built into this, but this is a good example of a big strategy. All right, uh, so now you might be asking yourself, self, uh, what if one of the players can't really choose their strategy, right? There are games that, that involve chance, right? They don't involve the second player. Sure, how about the game show Deal or No Deal? Uh, who's seen this one? Oh, now it's skewed up to the front right of the room. Interesting. Uh, so this game, you have a, there are a bunch of briefcases that all hold uh, amounts of money. The contestant picks a briefcase with the amount of money, and it slowly opens up all the other briefcases, revealing how much money they didn't win. Uh, occasionally, a banker stops and says, hey, I'm going to offer you this much money for your briefcase. briefcase. Do you want it or not? Right? And they say, yeah, I want it. Take money, leave. Or they say, no, and they open up more briefcases. Okay. So we're going to pick it up, uh, pick up a game here in the middle. Contestants down to five cases. One of those amounts she has, the other four she doesn't. She's got to open a case.
So the problem with these kinds of tech games, I've tried to simulate this in class, uh, is that um, students tend to not take the deal because, you know, it's not real money. I can't really offer you 163 grand. So uh, students tend to just play the game. Uh, but the students who analyzed this game show came up with this as their uh, matrix. It's you against the case, right? What, how much is in your, your briefcase? So for this, uh, this contestant, uh, her case, the four cases left are 10, 5,000, 200,000, or 500,000. Uh, if she does, if she says no deal, they're assuming she does no deal all the way through the game, she gets that amount. So that's her payoff in the second row. Uh, in the top row, you, the banker offered her $163,000. Uh, and so maybe we should have just written 163000 across the row there. But my students thought, well, wait a minute. If you take 163000 and your case only has $10, like in this left column here, don't you kind of feel good about yourself? Like you made a good deal? So they raised it 20%. They said, yeah, we're going to add a 20% like uh, good feeling bonus to that amount. That's why I didn't put dollar signs here. So this is taking the deal for 163000 plus the good feeling that you made a good deal. On the other end, if you take 163000 and you actually had 500000 in your case, you feel bad about it. So they deducted 20% for you. All right. So uh, what would you guys do? How would you pick this game? Notice I didn't put arrows left and right because the case can't move. The case can't pick it of the amount, it's, it's, it's in there. So how would you decide what to do? Sorry? You would do a deal, why? Um, because you don't know the, like, just... A bird in the hand yeah. is worth two in the bush kind yeah, of thing? Exactly. Okay, very good. That is one strategy. We'll get to it. You should take it because you're better off than where you started. You're better than where you started. True, but you'll be better than where you started no matter what. Ten dollars better. But it's, it's the best that you have right now with the known elements. Okay. Well, so right. At least in the same order of magnitude is the best option, whereas the, the worst options are nowhere near that. Ah, uh, orders of magnitude. Interesting. Anybody would play on? She got two cases worth more. Play on? Play on. Right. Well, this is what we call this is what we call a game against nature, right? And and it's tricky. <clears throat> you can't really draw arrows. You can't really do a big strategy because there is no mixing by the deal. Uh, sorry, the, the case. It is what it is. Right? So a lot of game theorists have come up with their own strategies as to how you can solve this. Right? One of them is to say, well, what row has the highest average or just the highest sum? Right? So I add up the two rows, and that says no deal. If you add up all the, the payoffs, the no deal row, the second row is better. Right? So close that thing, no deal. Another game theorist said, no, 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 you should be, as two of you said, conservative. You should, you should go for the row with the highest minimum. Right, the best worst case scenario. Well, that's where you make a deal, right? You're guaranteed at least the, the 130,000, right, minus some motion points, right? Uh, another game theorist said, wait a minute, uh, but I'm optimistic. Right, you're pessimistic, that last one. I'm optimistic. I think I got 500,000 in my case. So they came up with what's called the coefficient of optimism. You assign the probability that you think the best thing's going to happen, and then balance it with the probability you think the worst thing's going to happen. And whatever has the higher value in that row is what you pick. Uh, so this coefficient is 75% uh, of the best case. So if you're thinking, if you're 75% sure that you have $500,000 in your case, you should say no deal. That is the optimistic view of what to do in this game. And the last one kind of builds on what my students did. Students did. It might be where they got the idea. It's called the regret. Right? If you take that option, how much did you miss out on uh, in the opposite row? Okay, so which, which row has the least amount of regret? Uh, so for no deal, your biggest regret is right here. You get $10 when you could have had $195,000. That's the biggest regret. However, if you take the deal, your biggest regret is the final column where you took $130,000 and you could have had $500,000. And that's a bigger regret. You don't want to do that. Okay, so you take the smaller regret. You go with no deal. So three of the four options here say no deal. What do you think she did? It all depends on how you are as a player, right? It's your she personal preference. No deal. Now, uh, I am running short of time, but she gets down to ten dollars and five hundred thousand dollars. By the way. And she, she takes a deal for about 200000 And she had $10 in her briefcase. So she did pretty well. All right. So now you might be asking yourself, man, it's getting late. What am I going to have for dinner? 
Uh, but no, you should be asking yourself, didn't you say you could have more than two players? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, so let's look at three players here. Who's seen the movie Hunger Games? All right, that's pretty even. I'm trying to get newer and newer stuff in here, all right? Uh, all right, so the Hunger Games is, uh, is this future dystopia where you have the capital that holds all the money and power, and you have like these, uh, these precincts that are kind of like states. And every year they have to send two people, uh, uh, two teenagers, a boy and a girl, uh, to play this game to the death. Uh, and, you, and the game has one win. Now, this particular year, they made a new rule that said that if the two players are from the same state, the same district, they both get to be winners. Right, so that's where we're going to pick it up. That the two players from District 12, I believe, have made it to the end of the game, and they think they're going to be the two winners. They don't have to kill each other. Right? They, get to have, uh, they get to share the prize. <clears throat> Dark Knights. 
the, the Batman movie. At least six. Some of these we've talked about. Uh, number three, the chicken, game of chicken is involved in this movie. Uh, number six, the prisoner's dilemma is exactly what the get the, the match I was about. Some of these other ones are uh, different aspects of game theory that you might have that you might have heard about or you can definitely look up. Okay. All six of these are in the movie. The Joker is a pretty good player of game theory. So if you have the time and you have the interest, please review this movie and see if you can identify at least these six. There may be more that I don't use. Otherwise, thank you. I hope you enjoyed it.